more than the mortgage payment. So the values of those houses are going to drop. Nobody's going to want to buy them. Nobody's going to afford to buy them. And we, can, we just can't do that to that huge number of population. We need to protect them, and we need to protect our whole city. So um, I will, you know, like I said, continue to support each and every resolution that helps get our levies recertified by FEMA. Thank you. Recertifying the levies is, is, is very important. I live in the West End, and I went through a lot of this, and I'm sure there's quite a few people out here who went through this. But one thing we want to see is we don't want to see the city of Council Bluffs spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a firm to come in and tell us what we've done wrong and what we've done right. The money is, is, can be allocated for that. Uh, the, the state has the money. We just got to figure out how to get it from the state. But it's very important that we do get this um, uh, recertified because like Lynn said, the cost is going to be significant for us to have our insurance on our homes. Right now, West End is hard to, to even deal with. And, and the City of Council Bluffs has done such a great job of getting a lot of those streets done, a lot of the sewers done. And the City Council, I tell you, they've worked their butt off so far to get a lot of those uh, pumps and stuff in. But we still got to work harder. And the City Council has got to work together as a team and work together with the mayor and other uh, members of City of Council Bluffs to get this thing processed and make sure that we get it certified. Thank you. certification and everyone in the West End, three quarters of town, for example, becomes a flood zone, everyone's property value goes down. An easy estimate is a couple, anywhere from one to $200 a month extra on your mortgage payment. No one wants to afford that. No one wants to buy a house like that. Therefore, if I'm gonna buy your house, it's gonna be worth less. That does the opposite of what we need to do. Aside from the fact that if there is a flood, then we're all up the creek without a paddle, you know? So it definitely needs to be a priority for more, more reasons than just the, the immediate of, of uh, us people flooding out, you know. Um, people don't want to build if it's in a flood zone. It's not worth messing with because there's so many hassles. You have to get elevation certificates, things like this. It's, it's, there's no possible way we can allow this to not happen. It needs to be top of our list. And if that means we have to 
talk to the state, whoever we have to talk to, work with our local representatives, anything we have to do to get funding for it, that's what we have to do. So, thank you. Fourth question goes first to Mr. Wolf. And um, just to mess with you, it's a two parter also. <laughs> this is fun. <clears throat> first, there's a, this newly created political action committee, PAC, who did not disclose who its members and donors are. They're actively calling and asking people not to support at least two of the city council members who are running. What is your response to this PAC, and will you accept resources and or an endorsement from this PAC? And then secondly, as a candidate for city council, have you had direct contact with the PAC? And if so, would you disclose with whom you had contact? And because it's a two-parter, we'll give you two minutes for this one. So I want to talk about the first third, the second part first, if that's all right. Um, so as was reported in the Daily Nonquerel, Tom Winston did accompany me to the Nonquerel when I announced my candidacy. So I met Tom about two and a half years ago uh, when we started the Pace Board. And through those last two, two, two and a half years, um, Tom and I have really had a chance to talk about uh, where the city's going, how things are going, and things that we agree and disagree on um, in that area. So yes, Tom Winston did accompany me, uh, but he did so as an individual. He is supporting me as an individual. Um, and I appreciate the time that he spent just helping me with my candidacy, understanding the functions of candidate, um, how you set things up, how you set up, uh, you know, the, with the reporting of the state. These are all things that I've never done before, so I really appreciate Tom's help there um, as an individual. Now, regarding the PAC, I think PACs need to be more transparent all around. Um, it's true for the PAC that's referenced here in the question, it's true for any PAC that's out there. Um, these PACs are not doing what we want them to do. We need them to be more transparent. I will not accept any money or resources from, uh, from a PAC. Thank you. Anybody from PAC, and nor will I talk to anybody from PAC. 
If I'm going to run on this ticket, I'm going to run on my own beliefs and what I stand for. And I'm not going to run on anybody else's ticket. I'm going to tell you what I think, and if I'm wrong, I'll hear that too. But to take endorsements from everybody else, I don't need that. If I can't do this on my own and give what the people are asking for, not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear, then there's no sense of me even running. And I firmly believe that if I'm going to run, i got to make you people understand the issues that the City Council and the City of Council Bluffs is having. I don't need PAC or anybody else to come up and tell me what's wrong or what's right. I see this for myself, and I'm sure many of you out there see the same thing. Thank you. Um, to my knowledge, I've had zero contact with the, the PAC in question. Um, if I had, I would immediately disclose that information. Um, but again, I, I, I have not had any contact from this PAC. Uh, in fact, the extent of my knowledge regarding the Citizens for Successful Council Bluffs and any of their membership is limited to the information that was presented in the, in the recent non Pharrell article. Um, I will in no way accept resources or endorsement from the Political Action Committee. Uh, I personally don't feel that it benefits Council Plus in any capacity to have the Political Action Committee involved with this election, um, specifically uh, because this election is a nonpartisan election and an election for um, a city council which is meant to represent <coughs> the interests of a community as a whole. Um, you know, we're there to represent everyone, uh, as opposed to the opinions of a special interest group. Uh, so again, I reiterate, I, I have had not had any contact with the Political Action Committee, and I will not accept any resources or endorsements from them. Thank you. My purpose and my goal for running is that our families and our, our workers feel safe and they feel secure in their homes. I want to represent a voice on the council that, um, that says that these same people, our elderly, our, our working families, our young people, our people that are underserved communities, that, um, that they're just important to our city as businesses are. And I also want to represent and protect their dignity and their rights. So in my opinion, if this PAC agrees with what I want to represent, then sure, they can endorse me. That's fine. So I read the article in the paper a while back. I, uh, I expected a phone call the next you know, 24 hours. Needless to say, I didn't get one. <laughs> I always said distinctly, I want what's best for council gloves, or we're going to hire the best person for the job again, figuring email, letter, call, something, <laughs> nothing. I called around, and the folks I talked to didn't get one either. Um, I don't really know who they are or what they're doing. Um, I don't have anything to do with them. They apparently don't think I'm one of the chosen ones. So <laughs> at that, uh, no. I have had no contact with the PAC. Um, they're not giving money to anyone, so I don't have to worry about that, but I wouldn't really accept any cash anyways, because I don't know where it's coming from or what uh, they might have that they were gonna want in, in return. Uh, you know, no lunch is free, and uh, this isn't lunch, this is our town. So, um, thank you. I probably learned about the PAC the same time many of you did, as we all know, in the paper. Um, as having been on the council for eight years, I think that what I would have expected was maybe an interview and they would have talked to all of us that were running to find out what our goals are, maybe ask us some questions that were their mission to see where we fit in. That obviously did not happen. So it's hard for me to know what the mission of the PAC is and really even who the members are other than the few in the paper. Whether or not we've had contact, it's hard to say yes or no because, again, we're not certain who the members of that PAC are, but to my knowledge, I have not had contact with the PAC. They definitely have not identified themselves as a PAC doing an interview or asking questions of me. I think there are times when a PAC can be good. We have the police department, we have the fire department. They have PACs for their unions. And I think those are very clear what the mission is. You know who the members are. That's different to me. The mission here we aren't sure of. We don't know who the members are. And to actually be saying they're going to tell you who to vote for, I think that's frightening because I have confidence in all of you. You've elected us to make decisions on your behalf, and I have no doubt tonight is a great example.
you're all here listening and learning about each candidate, so you can decide who the right person is to vote for. And I hope everybody does that. I hope you take the time to ask questions, read the paper, come to a forum, and make an informed decision on your own. I want all of you, you're all very smart, you're intelligent, you know what's best for you, you know what person is going to represent you the best. So I think instead of a pack endorsement, I would much rather have the endorsement of each of you. The next question goes to Ms. Brannigan first. As you're probably aware, the approval for the location of the new police station was a decision given by the mayor without a prior vote by the city council. Please comment on this as a procedure to be followed for future projects. If you disagree with this as a procedure set by precedent, what would you set in place as a different procedure? Thank you. Well, even though I was no longer on the council um, during that discussion, I did watch many meetings from home so I could keep up to date on everything. Um, and I actually watched that particular meeting, and I clearly remember that the council voted on the location and the Woodbury site was approved. Um, there was a lot of discussion, though, at uh, the afternoon work session as well as the evening um, city council meeting about the process. Um, Mayor Walsh, after first checking with the city attorney, uh, put a 100% refundable deposit on a piece of property. I also remember him saying that he did it to save taxpayer money. Um, and he did that before anyone knew the city would be interested in buying it, because if that became public knowledge, that someone could have swooped in, bought it, turned around, jacked up the price to sell it to the city. And during my 12 years on the council, I did see that happen on many other properties that the city wanted to buy. It seems like many sellers think that the city's made out of money or that money grows on trees. I don't think the sellers realize, or maybe they just don't care, that the cost of these property purchases is paid by you and me and every other taxpayer. I never ever liked it when a seller gouged the city and taxpayers with outrageously priced terms. But sometimes we didn't have a choice. I know Mayor Walsh didn't need council approval to um, cut a $25,000 check but he really should have kept the council updated. If I was still on the council back then, I would have certainly voiced my opinion as well and loudly. The mayor missed the mark on that one by not keeping the council in the loop. I've done a lot of research on this, and I guess you gotta look at it, you gotta go back to the last administration that was in, in office. Um, you know, just like the President of the United States, they gotta pick up from the last administration, and it goes on and on and on and on. And granted, if, if, if Mayor Matt Walsh did do what he did, he should have checked with the city council. He should have got everybody's vote on it. But then again, the city council voted on it to, to let it go through. Um, my personal opinion, the city of Council Bluffs had a lot of land that they could have used instead of paying that chunk of money out. And I think that, that place was already allocated way before Walsh got in and before the other city council members got in. Um, and any time that you walk into an office and you've got to take up what's already there, it's pretty tough. It's no different when you start a new job and somebody else was there was a golden guy and you come in and now you're not such a golden guy, you gotta prove that you can walk in his footsteps. Well, it's pretty tough when you had to walk in uh, uh, Hannah's footsteps. You know, there's a lot of things that he accomplished and uh, throughout the years and I still think there's still gotta be a lot done. But as far as, as where the police station's going, you know, my opinion is I don't think it should have went there because it's not central location of Council Bluffs. It's going to create more issues in my book. But uh, I'm just one person's opinion, and that's what I think, and that's what I'm going to stand by. Um, and then from there, I think you take it to a town hall forum or a public 
discussion session or multiple, uh, so that you can obtain feedback from the community as a whole uh, in regard to those potential locations. Um, and then I think you can finalize it with, with taking that feedback that you receive from residents um, and having it reviewed by the city council, the mayor, and city departments uh, together uh, to discuss the pros, the cons, um, and any you know effects okay. that that location or that project may have on the city as a whole. Uh, this allows that kind of this allows that final decision to be made by a group of individuals as opposed to a single individual, uh, taking into account you know a multitude of perspectives uh, that benefit the community more. Thank you. Um, I believe the city council is elected by the people, the workers, our, our seniors, our young people, and um, I think that their views should be represented in any decision that's made for for the city. So I feel that the mayor and the city council should work together to assure that the people's views are being represented in any decision that's being made in the city. As I recall, at the time, the City Council did take a bit of an issue with the Mayor's actions. Though he had good intent, uh, that works out fine in this situation. The problem becomes down the road if he makes a, a choice without approval of the Council or, or the populace, which elects the Council, and it doesn't turn out for the better. Um, yes, in this case, Obviously 100% refundable, he said, and he was doing it to save us money, and, and who knows. Um, but when, when deals are made, when it comes to city taxpayer money, and they're made in the back room, they're not out in the open for everyone to see, people get a little uneasy. And again, I understand his point was to do it for the best interest of the city, to save us money, to save us time, and that's all well and good. I'm not saying it, it blew up in our face, but situations like that can. So uh, I believe the, the council had, had brought that up afterwards and, and now um, it was kind of stated that, that he is to check with the council before that um, process happens again and, and going forward. So that's probably a good practice. So thank you. I actually was on the council when this all happened and I was also part of the planning committee for the new police department. Obviously, it's very important to have this new department. We all knew that. And I do feel the mayor had the best interests of the city at heart when he made this agreement. He was really worried that if word got out, the price would increase, which would increase the overall cost of the building, and also be a cost to the taxpayers. That being said, it was incorrect. We had lengthy discussions with the mayor, with the city attorney, um, both in public at study sessions, just to determine that in the future, this really was a decision that should have been ran by council first. Um, I think a way to solve it would have been to have us call a special meeting. We could have easily called a special meeting, had the discussion, still approved it before word was really out that would have allowed an increase. So without a doubt, this is not a precedent that was set. It was very clear after the fact that even though this turned out for the best and the intent was right, it was not the right way to handle things. And so I don't foresee that happening again in the future. So I think really the key thing here is transparency. Um, I think that uh, Mayor Walsh really acted in the best interest of the city. Um, I think there was no ill intent there. But at the same time, we need to make sure that the, the proper process is followed. So we need to make sure the city council is informed and understands what's, uh, what the decisions are and where we're moving forward. Um, and after all, that's why we're here. Um, and I think the city council also needs to make sure that they're taking into account um, those that are also working on commissions and everything to make sure that we're making the right decisions all the way from top to bottom. It's not just this one decision. Um, we need to make sure transparency is there for all the decisions. And, as Melissa mentioned, there's many ways that we can get around this, whether it's a special session or other discussions, um, but those need to occur in the, in the future so that we have uh, transparency as well as consistency across the decisions. I don't think so. <laughs> those, are, those are the rules. What do you say? Can you reiterate on that real quick? No. Okay. The public is supposed to. That's right. So if you want to spend 15 seconds on the next question, reiterate it, you can do that. Those are the rules, right? You know I'm just teasing you, right? Now the next question does go to you, Mr. Troublemaker. 
When Lenin bids, Iowa State Code provides that they must be awarded to the lowest responsible bidder. Would you support a proposal to define responsible for letting bids on building projects that includes a company's safety record and history of coming in on time and under budget? One minute, 30 seconds. <laughs> well, taking the, uh, I wrote this down because this is one of the most important things on this. It says, uh, taking the lowest business knowledge provide the city with outside contractors with uh, quality workmanship. The city of Couch Plus needs to become more diligent during the section of process or selection of process and having a firm decision on words responsible within code. Not a lot of people can, can actually respond to that and, and give me the direct definition of responsible. The city of Council Bluffs has went into a lot of things, has caught a lot of things by hiring people with the lowest bid. The lowest bid isn't always the right thing. And the city of Council Bluffs has found that out on a lot of a lot of construction going around town. I think this is something that needs to be changed. It has to go to the state legislature, and I get that. But a lot of the money comes out of the city budget, and it creates a big issue. Then they got to turn around and have it redone again because they took the lowest bid, and now they got to go back and try to collect it, which creates more money to go back and get it. Um, to define the word responsible causes uh, poor quality workmanship, injuries, death, leading to possible issues for the city of council bus. You get people in here who's not certified, who doesn't have the right tools to do the job, they get hurt. Okay, so it comes back on the on the construction worker that that uh, um, is is working for the company, but at the same time it comes back and it gives the city of council bus a, back, uh, a bad name and a black eye. So to me, the, the lowest bid Morning. isn't the right way to go. Thank you. Um, in letting bids, uh, I think choosing the lowest bid can be an attractive option from a financial standpoint. Um, but again, simply going with the lowest bid without consideration for some additional information or some additional factors, uh, you know, can have some serious problems, um, some serious issues that the city would face uh, in doing so. Uh, and so, I, I firmly support a proposal that that would define what responsible is um, in, in more universal terms, terms that can be easily applied to situations like letting bids. Um, you know, and I understand that determining where to start and stop that kind of definition may be a difficult, um, a difficult thing to do. Uh, but you know, it has to look at other factors you know, when we're letting bids. We have to look at things like past performance, safety records, um, and, and whether or not that contractor under budget, on schedule, um, those are all things that affect our community and affect the projects that we have going on in our community. Um, and I would actually say that we should take that a little bit further and, and even look at things like, uh, you know, if that contractor came in on time and on budget for similar projects as opposed to just random projects, um, you know, making sure that they're not in over their head with the project that they are bidding on. Uh, sometimes the lowest bid is a bid that maybe they don't have that much experience with that type of project. Warning. Um, and so, you know, if, if we define, define responsibility, we may be able to prevent that kind of thing from happening in the, in the future. Thank you. I would support uh, a proposal to define responsibility on bids that includes safety records and history of time. And under budget completion, I think that would be important that we um, we know we know those aspects of it to assure that we're not wasting our taxpayer dollars and that we are protecting our workers. I would support that. In my day-to-day -day operations at at, uh, at my job, oftentimes we'll tell customers, you know, you don't always go with us or our office, our business, because we're the cheapest in town. You go with us because we know what we're doing, you know you'll be taken care of, and we're the best man for the job. That can also be said to, to have some weight in situations like this. And I understand that we want to go with lower bids, technically uh, everyone says that it's our money and, and that's, uh, that's the almighty dollar wins the, wins the day sometimes. But adding this and making changes like this do allow for us to have some quality control. Allowing to always take the lowest bid makes it simple. If I want the bid, all I gotta do is figure out what everyone else is doing, and I'll just cut it in half, and then I'll make it up on the backside somewhere else. And that doesn't always work out for us. 
expounding on that, I think it would be also nice to maybe put a little something in there to give credence to folks that are, are Council Bluffs based businesses versus out of town businesses. That's also important, you know. And, and does it need to be concrete? No. But if we could put legislation or, or wording rather in, in this on the city level, that would give uh, give us a second look at maybe the folks that are that are from Council Bluffs. Um, we always say at work as well, you know, we do business with those that do business with us. So I think it's important to, to do business with